It is my pleasure today to introduce Michael Brenner, who is a professor of physics and a Michael F. Cronin Professor of Applied Mathematics and Physics at Harvard University. In addition, Professor Brenner is a research scientist at Google Research. He earned a Bachelor's of Science degree at the University of Pennsylvania and obtained a doctorate at the University of Chicago. Professor Brenner's research focuses on methods and ideas of applied mathematics to address a wide variety of problems in science and engineering. His current research projects range from efforts to understand the design rules for creating synthetic material with lifelike properties to specific problems in fluid mechanics, material science, and biology. And last but not least, uh, a lot of his uh, recent research efforts focus on how to use machine learning to accelerate scientific discovery, which brings us to today's seminar about the machine learning of partial differential equations. And with that, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and I look forward to your seminar. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for coming and for having me. So I should apologize in advance. I'm really bad at listening to directions, and I only just realized in the last 20 minutes that this was a 30-minute talk followed by 30 minutes of questions. So there are many more slides than this. So what I'm going to do, and I hope this is okay, is I'm going to set up the problem and then skip things, assuming that the problem is set up so that I can get to the what I think will be most interesting to this group, which is at the end, and hopefully it won't appear too chaotic. And if I don't get through it, I don't get through it, but but um, but anyway, I just want to apologize in advance. So the work I'm going to tell you about was done by the group of people that I want to acknowledge first. So there's a group um, at Google, um, Stefan Hoyer, Dmitry Koshkov, and Jamie Smith, who um, worked on the Navier-Stokes, machine learning for Navier-Stokes um, um, part, which is the second part of the talk, which I think is going to be the um, the, the most interesting to this to this group, along with uh, you know a larger group of of people. So Yohai um, was a postdoc at Harvard when we started this work with Stefan and and Jason. Um, anyway, um, so I will um, just jump into this. So um, and I guess I want to say you know the subject of machine learning just as a, a, a apologies for scholarship. So um, the subject of machine learning for PDEs is a large field that is rapidly growing, and there's tons of outstanding work that's going on. And I sort of, you know, really like it when people are scholarly in their presentations. And I'm not going to, I just want to apologize in advance that I'm not going to be scholarly here today. Instead, what I want to just get through is the way that we've been thinking about this problem and what we've been doing um, with the hope of stimulating conversations. But I just want to make it clear that there's a really big and exciting field out there um, that I'm just not paying pro proper homage to. Okay, so this is the part where I go fast. So we tell students that PDEs, when we teach PDEs to students, we tell them that a PDE represents an infinite number of degrees of freedom, um, and that indeed when we solve them numerically, you know, as in climate and weather, um, for example, um, within this context, um, you know, there are an infinite number of degrees of freedom, which means that we we basically resolve them by using large numbers of mesh points to um, to resolve every possible scale. But but we really know that in a particular situation, this isn't the case. That the solution manifold has a finite dimension. And in fact, I would argue that you know historically, the goal of applied mathematics as a subject has been precisely to find approximate representations of the solution manifold in specific situations um, to make them useful for comp computing. And um, this is, you know, there's a, you know, a century of approximation methods that sort of go after this, but yet when we actually compute things, you know, um, you know, in the computer, we, we really haven't figured out, and I think that this is a fair comment, you know, how to take advantage of this. And this, you know, movies of the weather, there are movies of things and that basically, you know, things are computationally expensive. So, the way that we develop numerical methods, of course, is by taking an equation, and here's Berger's equation, which I will use as a simple example in a little while. And we, of course, you know, one, we have to break it up into a bunch of discrete, you know, uh, in, into, a, into a bunch of variables that live on a mesh, you know, by using discrete, discrete operators for the finite derivatives. And that reduces the PDE into a set of ODEs. And then ultimately, we end up with this set of discrete numerical update rules that we teach students and that we indeed derive ourselves, how one starts with the original equation and through whatever hook or crook um, numerical method you want, get a numerical update rule to update the solution at every time step. And then we simply just roll this out. And that's that's the way that numerical methods works. And so this I'm not I'm going to skip the slide in the interest of maintaining my 30 minute thing. But what I meant to say was that, you know, if you think about fluid turbulence, um, then this presents an impossible conundrum because 
of course, the range of scales is very large. And, you know, Kolmogorov taught us what the ratio is of the largest scale to the smallest scale um, um, through the Kolmogorov scale. And degrees of freedom, just the number of like Kolmogorov eddies that can fit in a box scales like a huge power of Reynolds number, like the Reynolds number to the nine fourth power. And, you know, if you basically choose to use, I don't know, 10 points per Kolmogorov eddy or whatever, you end up with a number of grid points that are required to resolve a direct numerical simulation, which is, is, is it was impossible 50 years ago. It's impossible today. It will basically always be impossible. And the question that we really face, you know, as a community is how do we get around that and do more accurate simulations, um, you know, for example, of climate and weather where, you know, computational grid boxes tend to be much larger than the degrees of freedom, which are certainly mattering. And of course, there's a long intellectual history of this subject. Um, here, I'm going to skip this point. I mean, at this point, this slide makes the point that, you know, even the individual, even this estimate, right, um, you know, of counting Kolmogorov and eddies is a massive overestimate of the real number of degrees of freedom in the system because there are correlations between the eddies and, you know, one really needs to take into those this is a, sort of a huge problem for our community. It's been a huge problem for our community for a long time. And the question that we've been interested in that I will discuss in this talk is to what extent can we use machine learning to basically recognize repeated patterns within the solution to better um, solve, more efficiently solve, and to better understand um, partial differential equations. So, um, and this is all based on the idea that, you know, there is a solution manifold, an underlying solution manifold, if one could parameterize it then, you know, um, then and compute with it, then there would be a huge cost savings. So, um, so, okay, I've already said this part. Sorry, um, this is the part where I'm skipping slides to catch up. So th this talk has um, sort of, I'm going to have this talk have two parts. And actually, I have references to papers of these parts because I seem to be going quickly and just to make sure that people um, understand. So the, the first thing I'm going to tell you about is an idea um, uh, which we call learned discretizations, and I'm going to explain via simple 1D examples, which I think what sort of makes the pedagogy the idea clear. And this is a paper that was published in PNAS um, in 2019. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip to a paper that we just posted to the archive last week, which is applying these ideas to two-dimensional turbulence. And, um, and that's what I'm going to do in this talk. So, by the way, I know the spirit is that no one's supposed to interrupt me, but I'm self-conscious, so if you want to, then go for it. Um, okay, so we are inspired by what I'm about to say by um, the example of single image super resolution. So this is a machine learning computer vision method where one takes an original image, um, you know, at its original resolution and downsamples it um, to be able to store it better. And then one is presented with the problem of how does one upsample the downsampled image to reconstruct the original image. And of course, the simplest way to do this is to simply use some sort of an interpolation scheme on the pixels of the downsampled image. And if you do that with bicubic splines, then the image is blurred. But, you know, computer vision people have discovered that, you know, by using neural networks locally, that is, are acting at little local parts of the image, one can, can sharpen things up considerably. And these neural networks are trained on, for example, large number of consumer images. So from the point of view of, um, of numerical analysis, numerical analysis, of course, upsamples with interpolation. That's what we do. We consider some type of interpolant that we're sampling with, and we tend to use functions that are that are you know as general as possible, so that we can represent whatever it is that might happen. And the the thought was that maybe basically that what the neural networks might be doing is learning something about the underlying functions in the set of images and using those to upscale. And that idea should be applicable to PDEs as well. So just as a toy example to get you all in the mood, um, imagine that that these curves are solutions to some PDE. And I don't tell you what PD they are, but I want to numerically solve them. And so the way we typically go about this, of course, is we choose grid points. And I've purposefully chosen grid points to essentially under-resolve the shock in this picture. We then erase the original solution, and I then give you only the solution on the grid points. And I ask you to please time evolve the solution in time. So in order to do that, given the PDE, the PDE depends on the value of the function and its spatial derivatives. So I need to be able to estimate the spatial derivatives of each of the red points. But of course, if I do this using like a polynomial interpolant, then, you know, there are well-known problems that cause you to make errors when the solution is under-resolved. Um, and so on the other hand, if I told you that actually that th these dots corresponded to solutions of Berger's equation, which is one of my favorite 
equations. And, you know, if you're an expert, and I, I told you that here are lots of examples of solutions to Berger's equations, which I could generate with my computer beforehand, then you know, and if you're an expert in Berger's equation, then you well know that, that you know, the, the polynomial interpolants that I showed can't be solutions to Berger's equation. In fact, the Berger's equations can only be chosen from this set. So th the notion is, is that what I'm going to now do is when I build my interpolant, instead of using general functions, I'm going to just build a regressor based on what I know can happen and then use those to compute derivatives. And of course, this works much better, right? When you do this, the, the yellow curve um, works much better and, um, and lets you, and, and that's the basic idea that we're going to bootstrap off of. So what we're going to be in the business of doing today is the following. I want you to imagine I have a high resolution simulation that you've acquired through some means. And then I'm going to imagine that you coarse grain it. Um, so this picture on the right is an exact coarse graining of the solution. So what we've done is taken the high resolution simulation. We've drawn it into smaller boxes. We've averaged the solution within the boxes. And you're looking at the time course of it there. But what we want to ask is, suppose we solve the numerical method on the coarse grid instead of the fine grid. Can we get a stable time evolution operator to work on the coarse grid? Now, you all know um, better than I that, of course, if you try to do this, there are two classical problems that occur with classical methods. So one is that if you use, for example, a simple finite volume method that, um, you know, it's sort of easy to find coarse grid situations where the solution destabilizes basically when you evolve it on the coarse grid, or you can use a more fancy method and then the solution doesn't destabilize, but it blurs out. And there's been, you know, there is, you know, a canonical tension between accuracy and stability that we, you know, as a community have been forced to confront. And so, and this is the core of what we want to try to go after and what I'm going to tell you today. So what we're going to do is we're going to do things like take, so we want to, to learn equation specific methods for numerically solving PDEs. So that is, we're, I'm going to discuss a class of methods which try to produce exact solutions that are coarse, right, on a coarser mesh than can ordinarily be done, but that the, the methods can only be applied to specific equations. So this is a, taking a hit from, you know, classical numerical analysis. On the other hand, so, and I guess I don't have to convince this group, we don't, we don't really care about that many equations. So actually, as long as you could do that for the right equations, it would be a big win. And what we're going to be doing are things like this. We're going to replace the derivative operator. So this is the discrete derivative operator that we trivially derive from calculus. We're going to replace it with a machine learned alternative Alternative. So we'll, for example, learn an interpolation that is typical for the solutions of an equation and use those to advance the solution in time. So, okay, so here is the idea. Here is just an initial idea. So, we, as I said, we call this learned interpolations. So generic interpolations are sort of depicted on the left. I mean, you basically take the solutions at some mesh points, you um, and you basically, you know, interpolate with Lagrange polynomials or whatever basis set you'd like, and then take the derivatives of the formula to derive a discrete formula for the Lth derivative. In learned interpolations, what we're going to do is we're going to take the solution um, at a discrete set of mesh points. We're going to send it through a neural network, which will predict the interpolation weights alpha that it will learn based on data in a way I will show you in a minute, and then that will give the derivative formula. And so these are um, analogous, but in the case that I'm going to be telling you about, we're going to be learning the interpolation rates. So, okay, so the general method is the following. How do you learn the interpolation rates? Well, you need data. Where do you get data? Well, you simulate data. And in particular, we can simulate large numbers of small pieces of solutions. Notice the word small pieces. This is what, one of the ideas here that we're going to be trying to upscale locally. And thus, the hope is that by, by you, you know, we don't have to do big simulations of, of fine resolution. We can do, you know, fine resolution of small pieces and stick them together to make the whole thing work. Okay. So here is the training procedure. So and um, so what we're going to do is this is as I said before we're going to take the solution at time t on the mesh points x n feed them through a neural network. Um, there's a polynomial accuracy layer at the end which basically takes the formula. We're here predicting c's. I unfortunately changed notation between the plot slides. These c's are the weights in the derivative rules, and we basically project these onto polynomial accuracy constraints to demand that the kth derivative has some order, basically, um, in the limit as the mesh spacing gets small. But of course, the whole point is that we're going to be operating them outside of that regime. We then take these formulas for the derivatives. We basically compute fluxes from them. From the fluxes, we um, we can compute the time derivative. And then, you know, if you know the, if you've already learned the, the network to give you the coefficients, you can time evolve by just going around the loop. 
If you don't know the, the, the thing, then what you can do is you can train it by defining some loss, um, which you can choose as you want um, to basically train the coefficients. Now, the way that we tra have trained this in the examples I'm going to give in today's talk is to is to take fine resolution, high resolution solutions and to um, and to use them and to basically demand that on a coarse grid we reproduce the re re reproduce pointwise the um, the 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 um, the fine mesh solution and that's the way that we train this. So um, so what does this give? So this is a solution to Berger's equations. Um, so these are the stencils that are given for the first derivative operator that is um, given out of this. And what you should notice is is that at different places in the solution there are different stencils. So the stencils depend on the solution. For example, the stencil for computing the derivative operator um, in the vicinity of the shock is different than that in a part of the solution where it's relatively smooth. And the algorithm learns this in, in order to basically maintain the sharpness of the shock. And so basically the summary is that this works. Um, and I'm going to just show you some plots that this works, how this works in these 1D examples, and then I will move on to turbulence. Um, so this is a baseline method on the left, which uses 64 points. Um, and you'll notice that it destabilizes. So this is the neural network, which basically means the discretizations come out of the neural networks. And with 16 points, it remains stable for a long time. Um, so our model, we're able to use this to train it on small pieces because since we're learning, what we're learning really are local features of the flow, we can train this locally and then and then roll it out globally. So the training domain for this solution of Berger's equation is is this black box. So it's from zero to two pi. But here we've we've solved for a solution which is in a box of size twenty pi and rolling it out in time. Um, and this is with thirty two times upscaling from the baseline um, method. So let me just show you some numbers for accuracies in these 1D problems. So this plots the mean absolute error as a function of the resample factor. The resample factor is how, how much we've coarsened the grid over the, 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 you know, the high resolution solver. So these mean absolute errors are computed um, as the L2 distance between the integrated solution and the ground truth, which was solved at high resolution. And we're doing both a space time average where the, the where the, the, um, the, the solution is being solved it's in a situation like this where the domain is much larger than the training region. So, and we're integrating over all of space and we're integrating out in time to 15. So that's like, you know, looking in this, this part of a region. That's what this is an error of. And this compares the error for a series of different methods. There's first order um, and third order nor normal numerical methods. There's the WINO method, which is the state of the art method um, with handcrafted coefficients for um, solving you know, shock equations. And this purple is the neural network, which outperforms it significantly. If we, in our optimized code, demand that the algorithm has constant coefficients so that they don't change in, um, in space, then we can actually find a method. The, the, the algorithm will converge onto a method that, that basically is, has the same accuracy that we know method actually and just for the experts in the audience but that's only when we impose i should have written this on this that the green dots also have gotten off type flux constraints imposed which of course are very natural and so so that which is sort of comforting to know that one can recover you know um the that but but, but then you can beat the ground truth so um so i'm gonna skip these slides because i'm running out of time and um, we did this on lots of equations it generally works um there's a if you, any of you are interested in this and you want an example, there's a, a simplest example you can possibly imagine is 1D advection, where we also did this. And actually, Zhao Wei Zhuang, who is an atmospheric chemistry graduate student at Harvard, did this and posted this to his GitHub site, just uh, GitHub site, a tutorial on using this with his um, with the advection equation, which is a nice way to sort of see how this works. And um, and that is that. So I'm now going to move on to talk about more complicated turbulent flows. Actually, in the talk, I had passive scalars and turbulent flows and 2D turbulence, but I'm going to just skip right ahead to 2D turbulence, if that's okay, um, unless anyone has anything to say. So I'm going to, um, does anybody have anything to say? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, cool. So, um, so okay, this, as I said, is based on a paper that was, um, that was just posted. Um, Last week. So, okay. Um, so we're interested in seeing if we can apply these methods to the Navier Stokes equations. Um, and so, what we seek, so, and what I've described so far, so what's sort of unusual, I think, about the methods 
that we've that I've described is that the um, is that you know in opposition to, for example, you know LES models or models that use eddy viscosities, which are trying to capture local statistical properties of the flows. Here we're trying to demand pointwise agreement between the coarse solution and the fine solution. And what we're seeking are numerical update rules. We want numerical update rules that basically allow you to stably integrate the equation on long rollouts in which the, the, coarse, the, the coarse grid solution it, it, it hits the, the, the accuracy of the fine mesh, but of course at significantly, one would hope, reduce computational costs because the grid is coarser. So this um, seems to be a sort of different type of solver um, and and this is and what we're trying to figure out here is is how well this this can work. And I guess I, I have this comment here that traditional turbulence models proceed differently. I mean, LES, for example, spatially averages the nonlinear convective flows term. So you know you can you compute an averaging operator of the whole equation, and then once you have an op averaging operator of this, you have to model it, and um, and you know it ends up being an effective viscosity or something. And in for LES models comparing with with direct numerical simulations, the metrics tend to be statistical, like showing that spectra agree. This is a classic LES paper um, and qualitative. Whereas here we're we're really going, and this may be insane, but this is what we're doing: is we're going after pointwise agreement. So okay, so I want to just make a comment about update rules. So um, classically, of course, you know when we teach numerical analysis, we derive update rules. We teach classes on uh, how do you derive from calculus update rules. Um, if one uses machine learning, there are lots of choices for update rules, and I just want to acknowledge them all up front because I don't think it's it, it's there's no theorem that states that one is better than the other. So an example of an interesting update rule is a pure machine learning update rule. Namely, what I just showed you was about learning a discretization, which was really using the structure of the equation in great detail. But you don't need to do that. I mean, what you can do and what people do is you could just basically say, let's forget the equation. I'm just going to replace it with a neural network, and that will be my update rule. So that's a perfectly reasonable update rule. So another thing you can do is you could combine the update rule with physics in some way. And this basically block diagram rep represents what I showed you a, a moment ago, which is learned discretizations. What we do is we take the solution and we pre-process it into a neural network to get the um, to get the the um, the um, interpolation coefficients to then put into a normal physics solver. And and so. <clears throat> So this is um, this is a um, so it's sort of a pre-processing, and that's another type of an update rule. Now, one would hope, and actually, I'm going to show you that basically by including physics in the solver, at least what we see is that the solver becomes much more generalizable um, than it does otherwise. Um, so one would hope that there was an advantage to doing something like this, but I think it's an open question as to how best to do this. So this is a second um, way of choosing an update rule. Oh, and actually, I should say, so here is the particular way that we, the update rule and what I'm about to show you works. So what we do is we take the input velocity field. This is going to be in two spatial dimensions in this talk. And we we push it through a neural network um, to, to get, um, you know, interpolation coefficients, um, as I said before, um, to compute the convective fluxes. Um, we then basically, um, um, you know, conserve mass. Um, we time step and we do a projection, a pressure projection onto divergence free velocity fields. And that is the block that's going to be used in what I'm going to describe to you in a moment. So another um, approach that one could use, and I think this is also an interesting approach, is that one could start with the numerical discretization. And that's what I mean by physics in this spot, but on a coarse mesh. And um, one could then say that, uh oh, I made a mistake because you know, the mesh is coarse and you could sort of train a neural network as a corrector to it. And that's a, we call that learn corrections. Um, and that's a, a sort of another approach to including an update rule. And there are probably more versions of update rules that one could consider. And I mean, I think generally what we, the community needs to do is try them all and see what works better um, for, the, for the purposes. So there's no a priori way of determining which one of these is better. The only way, at least not now in our like, steam engine before Carnot version of the world um, with no theory. The only thing we can do is systematically compete them against each other. And that's what I'm about to show you. So, okay, so the other thing I want to talk about before I show you results is what does it mean for a model to be better? So this is an important comment um, because there, there's a lot of results out there and there's a lot of things one can do and I think we have to be careful. So we need both accuracy and generalizability. I've already told you about accuracy. Our current approach to accuracy, although one could easily adopt other metrics is to 
um, reproduce DNS on a coarser mesh with bigger time steps. So generalizability, um, we're, we're interested in solving the laws of physics and the laws of physics have this wonderful property that if I change the situation, then it still works. And we really require that, we should require that um, as a consequence of our update rule. Um, so we, for that reason, have designed a set of generalization tests, and I will show you them in a second, but they are sort of different hierarchies of difficulty, and I, I, I think this is important. So the, the simplest um, generalization test is like the sort I showed you in the 1DPDE, PD, which is that what you do is you solve the thing, like you solve the navier Stokes equations with some initial condition, um, and you train it on that with some forcing, and then what you do is the generalization, you choose different random initial conditions. So these are initial conditions and thus flows that weren't in the initial set. And so they are, you know, legitimately called test sets that is independent of the way that it was trained, but it's a very weak test set um, in the sense that, you know, we all know that the solutions are chaotic anyway, and they, you know, evolve in little blocks. So there's not a lot of generalization there. So the next level of generalization test is different forcing, and the next letter of general of level of generalization test, which is even harder, is different Reynolds numbers, which you know, namely changing equations, which for turbulent flows is something which is reasonable to think about because of the well-known universality of turbulent flows as the Reynolds number gets large. And um, so, so with that in mind, what I'm about to show you are results on two-dimensional turbulence. So we have um, what we do for training is we choose a particular example of force 2D turbulence, which is a forcing which was invented by Kolmogorov, which is called Kolmogorov forcing. And we then have a set of generalization tests. In addition to the, um, you know, different random initial conditions, we do generalization tests by increasing the size of the domain. We do generalization tests by turning the forcing off and letting it decay. And finally, we do generalization tests at higher Reynolds numbers. And what I want to do right now, and it's almost 3.30, but I'm going to take another couple of minutes, is just walk you through what we found from this. So, okay, so um, the results I'm going to show you are um, from a fully differentiable fluid mechanics solver that we wrote in JAX that will be open sourced hopefully very soon. It basically is a, it, it, um, it, it, it's a finite volume solver that uses this sort of um, discretization scheme showed here. And the beauty of it is it's fully differentiable. And so we can easily incorporate machine learning at wherever we want in this and compete things against each other. So, um, so here's a little um, snippet of code um, of how it works. I'm not going to um, belabor it. Um, okay, so these are results. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was, um, and I'm going to first start with learned discretizations, is we considered Kolmogorov flow with Reynolds number 1,000. Um, and um, we, um, we trained ground truth um, solutions trajectories with high resolution simulations, which were 2048 squared. So um, we demanded that each time step in the ground truth solver obeyed the CFL condition with factor of a with a factor of a half with a safety factor of a half. So DT scales with DX. Um, we then downsampled this to coarser grids to be used as training data. When we downsampled it, we also downsampled the time to maintain the CFL condition on the coarser grid um, with a factor of a half. In order to train the model that I'm about to show you. We use 32 trajectories, each of which has different initial random seeds, and we unroll it for 4,800 time steps. Um, the, um, the, um, and, and we basically train it with an L2 loss, basically, um, in accordance with what I was trying to say. So in order to evaluate the models, this turns out to be very expensive. The reason that model evaluation is expensive is that we really, you know, these update rules, the most important property of them is that they, they are stable on long rollouts. And the only way that one can check stability and accuracy on long rollouts is to generate much longer trajectories and verify that they remain stable over those times. And so that's what we did. The, the evaluation part is over tens of thousands of time steps. Of course, beyond a certain amount of time, the solution is chaotic. And so you can't expect pointwise accuracy anymore because when you're well beyond the Lyapunov time. But at that point, we can check statistical accuracy and statistical stability. Um, we do. So, okay, so I'm going to start by showing you the simplest example of a test set. So this is a test set which um, which was just a different random initial condition. And the the ground truth solution is is at the top here. It's um, 2048 squared, and this is rolled out for 1500 time steps. So the, the, the DNS solution that's downscaled by 32, a factor of 32, this is on, this is DNS, the bottom row. Um, you'll notice it sort of craps out very quickly um, because of numerical diffusion. The learned interpolation model on the same mesh, basically though 
um, well captures the solution. So this is the lowest level generalization test that one has, but um, in this case, the learned interpolation model passes. Moreover, we can use this to study this quantitatively. And so to do this quantitatively, let me show you a plot. So this is the vorticity correlation as a function of time step. And these curves, so the 2048 ground truth is, um, is this curve here. This is 1024. The red dashed line is our 64 by 64 learned interpolation model. This is 512 squared. And so what you see is, and this, this vertical dashed line here is the Lyapunov time. So actually beyond this time, there's exponential divergence of trajectories. What you see is that we basically um, achieve the same performance as a grid, which is 10 times finer um, using this model. Um, and um, this, this, this is maintained. If you look at spectral accuracy over much longer time steps, the spectrum basically remains constant. So, and now, and this is, I think, the, is extremely important in terms of computational efficiency. So we ran these experiments on TPUV fours, and um, the um, and the um, and basically the deal is is that the um, that the, the ML models, of course, require more um, more numerical operations because we have to compute these neural networks at every grid point. So there are about 150 times more operations in the ML solver than the baseline CFD solver. But because of the TPU and the, the high throughput in terms of flops, um, it's, it turns out only to be about 12 times slower. Now, I told you that we have a 10x gain in terms of upscaling from the grid. So 10x is, um, is so that, that re results in a time savings of 10x cubed because there are two for space and one for time. And then if you divide by 12, that's about 80 times faster for the, for the, um, for the, for the um, ML model. And just to sort of draw home, we sort of did extensive tests on this, basically for upscalings of different, you know, for down samplings of different size meshes. And what we see over, so this is plotting the runtime per step as a function of the time um, at which the correlation between the solver ends up being less than some threshold, which we just chose to be 95%. And what you see is, is that we're able to achieve the same accuracy with about a factor of 86 about a factor of 86 faster. So that's the, um, so that sort of switches the, you know, the, 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 the line in this trade off from, you know, standard algorithm. So now let me just quickly flip through some generalization tests and then I will end because I know I'm reaching time. So this is the same thing, except that now we're using decaying turbulence. So I want to emphasize what I'm about to show you is with the same model that was trained before, we have not retrained the model. Um, so this is decaying turbulence. Here's the 2048 squared baseline. This is DNS. I mean, this is the DNS at 64 squared, which drops off quickly. This is the learned interpolation. You see, we've put boxes around the vertical structure so that you can see that it's tracked. If you look at vorticity correlation as a function of time, we're not doing better now than the than the um, than the 512, slightly worse. But this is about a factor of seven or eight times upscaling um, over before while maintaining the same accuracy. So this is the hardest generalization test: is to go up to higher Reynolds numbers, and I need to explain this briefly. So. If you believe in the turbulent cascade, then what you what you what you might imagine is that what these things are doing is learning the the solutions around the smallest scale eddies and building numerical algorithms around them. Now, in two D turbulence, the Kolmogorov scale, namely the the scale at which dissipation kicks in, um, scales like one over the square root of Reynolds number. So, what that means is is that if you jump from Reynolds number one thousand, which is where I where we train the previous models to Reynolds number 4,000, then that corresponds to a factor of two decrease in the scale, in the Kolmogorov scale. So what we did was to take the model that we trained at Reynolds number 1,000, and we cut the grid spacing by a factor of two. We used exactly the same model other than that, and we then applied it directly to Reynolds number 4,000. And again, you can see the comparison between the DNS and the learned interpolation. You'll notice that the grids are bigger because we needed to to maintain the same accuracy in this from the previous, but again, the learned interpolation massively outperforms the baseline and and leads to something like eight x upscaling um, of the thing. And so, um, like I said, this wasn't we didn't make any effort to actually train this for Reynolds number scaling, but this I think demonstrates that Reynolds number scaling is possible. And finally, this is a similar result on a larger domain that I won't belabor. So. Um, and this will be my last idea, and then I will stop. I'm sorry, I'm going over. So we um, were very interested in doing this and comparing as many different models to each other as we could. So we took the models. Remember, I told you there were pure ML models, there were learned correction models, and we basically competed them all 
on these different test sets, force turbulence, larger domain decaying turbulence, higher Reynolds numbers with different accuracy metrics, point-wise accuracy, statistical accuracy, stability. And I have a bigger version of this slide on this talk, and I don't, there's a lot of stuff here. LI is learned interpolation, LC is learned correction, EPD, and this is, this is an encoder-decoder architecture. These two are pure ML models. ResNets and encoder decoder op. Uh, and if you just look quickly at this, and these different dots are different runs, different trained models for each of them. Um, and essentially, what you see broadly when you look over these plots, and I don't have time to go through this in as much detail as it deserves, is that the physics ML hybrids perform the best. They basically um, are more accurate, they are more generalizable. You'll notice that, like, for example, on the decaying turbulence um, test set, the, um, the pure ML models really don't do very well. They've never seen it before. On the higher Reynolds number, they do even worse. They've never seen it before. They simply can't keep up. Whereas, because we've built in both learned interpolations and learned corrections, the structure of the Navier-Stokes equations into the solver, it appears to be much um, more generalizable. So, the learned interpolation basically sort of has the highest performance on these test sets, but the learned correction is only slightly behind and in many ways is a simpler um, model. So, and finally, we did this directly on large eddy simulation showing similar results. I know I'm out of time. Um, what I want to say, as a, and this will be my last slide, I'm really sorry I organized this. This was not a 30 minute talk. So, I just, so we're in the early days of this, but from where we are now, it seems reasonable to extrapolate. So, the runtime um, basically, so let capital T be the runtime, let N be the number of grid points, let K be the effective course grading factor that you're allowed to get away with. To, um, to solve with a given accuracy. And this, of course, is raised to the D plus first method for the power for the type of explicit method that I've been describing. So there's C physics is the cost of the physics solver. CML is the cost of the ML solver. And you could ask how much cost savings could you get out of this? So right now, as of today, at least in our hands, the ratio of the ML cost to the physics cost is 12. We believe there's substantial room to improve this. We have not tried, but, um, but that at least gives an initial thing. So the 10x decrease that we find in required resolution, we believe, although, you know, all we know is what I told you, but we believe this is probably fundamental. That is, it's unlikely you're going to beat this and maintain pointwise accuracy. This must be roughly the upscaling that you can do and still know that there's an eddy inside of your box to try to interpolate to. So if you were to basically extrapolate this 10x to 3D, then this um, has, and just using all of these numbers, then that would suggest that there's a sort of 1,000 to 10,000 times um, potential speed up that is in this type of algorithm. Now, this, of course, does not solve the intractable scaling problem that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, which is, of course, core for the climate community. I mean, this is not going to, you know, there's a long way between resolving the flow and 100 kilometer meshes. But what I would say is that every factor of 1,000 helps. And moreover, this is only a particular formulation of how you could have frame these models. And I think that there's just a ton of other things you could try and make things better. So um, let me stop there. I appreciate your um, attention. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take the next 20 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat box or you can use your raise your hand button next to your name and you can ask it out loud. So with that, I do see a couple questions in the chat box. Um, let's we'll start with the one by Paul. You Ulrich, he says, great talk. Thanks. Generally, grid codes are memory bounded instead of co compute compute bounded. Were these problems small enough to fit entirely on the GPU? If so, how do you expect wall clock time to be affected when the problem can't fit? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So, um, so these we we everything that was in this we did on single TPUs. Um, the um, but but clearly in order to go especially to three D. Right, that is no longer one needs distributed um, computing, and we're currently working on that. Um, but I agree that that's a challenge. I mean, the the one thing to say is that we that you know the machine learning overhead. Maybe this is a maybe this is a useful comment, or is that so? There is of course a machine learning overhead for doing these computations, but since much of the time in sort of typical physics solvers is, is writing the numbers in and out of memory, then we're, we're then you know the 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 utilization of the of the of the cores as low, and we're basically using the extra overhead to accelerate, to basically do the um, to do a bunch of the ML for free. So, but 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 for sure, this needs to be moved to distributed computations in order for it to, for it. Well, that, that's a critical next step. 
Thank you. Uh, let's take a question from the audience before we jump back into the chat. I see that Han Kai Zhao has a question. You want to go ahead and ask it? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I have a related question. So uh, do you think machine learning can learn how to solve arbitrary linear system AX equal to B? I give you, uh, this is for different A's. I, I, in another way of saying, learn to uh, find A inverse. You know, I give you a lot of A and it's inverse. Can you give a new A? Can you find it's A inverse? Yeah, um, that's one of those deceptively simple questions. That's, I, I don't know. I mean, that's my answer. That sounds really hard to me though. I mean, you know, this, so we, uh, I mean, that's like, you know, um, that sounds really hard to me for any A. Right, that's hard. So we're what we're banking on here in the work that I've described to you is the fact that the local behavior of solutions to PDEs have, you, you know, are lower dimensional than those of the interpolation schemes that we typically use. So we are basically learning local properties, and that actually you could imagine parameterizing. You know, once you get to solve any large problem with machine learning, I, it makes me putting on my applied mathematician hat, very nervous. Like, I sort of feel like we're not asking, I mean, this is, we're asking a lot in some sense, but we're also asking a lot in a very particular way where there's hope. But, I'm not sure that's, a, I didn't answer your question because I have no idea, but. Yeah, but, but when the coefficients are changing, right and, uh, initial, right and side initials are changing, it's like solving different AX equal to B though. No, but, 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 it's, but it's doing it in the context of a particular equation. So remember, we're training these things by looking at long rollouts of the solutions of, for example, 2D turbulence at a particular Reynolds number. And so what we're banking on is that the local behavior of those, although it is changing, you're right, but that there are patterns and that those patterns can be learned. So it's, it, it, I mean, what we're, I mean, this sort of gets back to what I was saying at the beginning, that the solution, the dimension of the solution manifold is not as large as we're telling our codes it is. And if we can learn those patterns, then we can tame them somewhat. And that's what we're trying to do. So I think it's actually a simpler problem than the one that you posed, what we're doing. We can talk about this more offline, but I, um, that's what I think. Thank you. All right, a question from Drew. Um, let me get to it. It's kind of long. So he says, this is mind-blowing work. Could you um, could you comment what might happen on level four general general's liability test? Uh, there are these are tests when some new dynamics might come in with change in RE or forcing. I am thinking of geophysical fluid dynamic models where some instabilities are not present under some forcing conditions. This is different from 2D slash 3D turbulence, which is more of a cascade process. Do you have plans to go in that direction? Um, we're very interested in going in that direction. And if any of you are interested, we would love to talk to you about it. That's one statement. Um, um, I, I, um, I agree that this is a relevant, this is a very relevant question. Um, I don't really have anything substantive to say about it beyond what has been said. So far, sorry, I know that's a non-answer. Um, I mean, you know, look, if there are patterns, we should be able to parameterize them. I mean, I guess that's what I would would say, right? Um, if there are if there are patterns, we should be able to parameterize them. And local, if there are local patterns, we should be able to parameterize. And you know, global patterns that are made out of local cat patterns, that sounds good, you know. Um, I uh, see a question by Mike Pritchard. Do you want to go ahead and, and unmute yourself? Okay, sure. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you know, I can't, I can't resist thinking about <laughs> trying to take this to the climate modeling limit. Um, there are several things seem overwhelming. You know, it's no longer one equation, but a terrible mess of interacting equations and parameterizations. Um, but I'm especially concerned about the rollout issue. I think you commented that you needed like to, to set for statistical stability in the spectra, like some uh, ten thousands of time steps or, or something for this experiment. But can you elaborate on how that number arises or whether, yeah, is there a principal way to think about the the amount of forward integration that needs to be coupled with the optimizer of the full model in order to... Well, when we, we didn't optimize it over that much. So to be clear, we, the optimization was over much shorter time steps, right? That was that was the number that was used for evaluation to check for stability in the, in the forward algorithm. Because, you know, the thing to always worry about when you're doing the sort of thing that's here is that 
the model somehow blows up because something happens as you're rolling it out that it hasn't seen and the neural network goes nuts basically and then you know you end up with something which is completely ridiculous i mean of course this happens in standard numerical analysis too but in standard numerical analysis we have well-known methods to assess for stability locally that will give you a good sense of whether or not the rollouts will happen for a long time and no such theory exists here so i guess that's my main so i think i don't i'm sorry this is you guys are asking really good questions which i don't have good answers to you know there we're missing a lot of theory here right now and so um, you know, I would have thought that rolling out, if you've got the thing that rolls out over tens of thousands of time steps and it's stable with respect to the spectra, that you're likely going to be okay, basically. But there's no theorem that states that in this case. And I, my, the suspicion is, is that purely empirically, as we get experience with this type of methods, you know, if it did blow up, then what you would go do is go back and retrain it a bit and sort of make it better. And so I, you know, one suspicion is, is that, you know, this is sort of good enough in the sense that if something goes wrong, then at least you probably can fix it. But we are, and I mean, I think it's just the inherent problem in doing things this way, you know, with something that's machine learned as opposed to something that's like related by calculus to the original equations that um, that we don't have stability constraints yet. But but it's the wild west. I was telling somebody the other day, this is like, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, they're used in the 19th century, there were steam engines, right? And everyone was building their own steam engine. And, um, you know, you just wanted whatever steam engine that drove your car or your train or whatever. And, but then Carnot came along and he gave, you know, the principles of steam engines, you know, when he was quite young, actually. And we sort of need that here. So, but this is just an effort to sort of show what's possible. Sorry, I know I didn't answer your question, Mike. So I just- told I think you. I just misunderstood one thing. The training was local in time. Yeah, the training is local in time. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, so Zhao Wu has two questions. So we'll start with the first one. It seems like the Kolmogorov flow does not have a converged solution with the increase of the resolution. My question is, did you try to use this machine learning method to solve a flow with known converged solution and see if your machine learning method can get the same statistic? I'm not sure what he means by that. Why, why does the, it not have a converged solution? So I would have argued that on these you know, flows, I mean, here, let's just take the initial one, that the 2048 is converged, that this actually, if you cut the resolution, this is actually way overkill for the structures that are forming at this Reynolds number. If you cut the resolution, it is converged. So I guess I don't understand. Um, so this is a jaw. Uh, may I go to your, could you go to the next slide? Yep. Okay, so if we look at the resolution, when you go to uh, 2000 by 2000, the, the statistic, the the profile is there and even so what's the profile looks like when we oh, increase, good. keep oh. increasing the resolution yeah oh, okay good so let me let me just explain this this is good job thank you for bringing this up so this is the vorticity correlation so this is basically right the correlation the average correlation of the vorticity field over time this line right here you see this gray line this is the lyapunov time of the flow which we've computed separately so when you cut the resolution you wouldn't expect, you would only expect the trajectories to agree up to the Lyapunov time. And indeed, if you look at the 1024 rollout, which is this, it agrees with the um, with the ground. This, this thing is fixed to be one because we're measuring the correlation of it to itself. So it beyond 1024, beyond the Lyapunov time, you wouldn't expect it to agree. And that's what the one at 1024 does. And that's essentially what the learned interpolation does as well, although slightly worse. So I don't think that th this isn't showing lack of convergence. This is just showing that the equations are chaotic. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Right, and his second question, Zhao, do you want to ask your que second question or do you want me to read it? Okay, um, did you try the 3D flow, for example, the isotropic turbulence? Because they have... Yeah, we were, um, yeah, we were very interested in doing this for 3D flow and this is under, we were working on this. Okay. Now. Okay, thank you. I totally agree. If without that, then we're not there yet. Thank you very much. A question from Gavin D. Why do you think learned interpolation is slightly better than learned correction? Right. Okay, that's a good question. So I'm going to give you a hypothesis. And I actually noticed a couple of the other people from Google are on this. And if any of you guys want to answer any of this, you please should. But okay, I'll give you um, my answer. So I, so I actually, the zeroth order answer is, I don't know. However, 
Um, but, and that was good. So you're referring to this phenomenon that learn interpolation is here and learn correction is here. So when we added the correction, remember I said we were adding a correction, the way we added the correction is that we literally just added a term. We didn't, so in, in principle, right? So there's a, we added a forcing term to the equation. I mean, in principle, right? Any correction term should really be the divergence of a tensor because, you know, of conservation of momentum. And one hypothesis, which you know, this is purely a hypothesis is that, that this gap isn't real actually. And that it's simply because we didn't constrain this learn correction to be the divergence of a tensor and thus it doesn't, it, it's not enforced to obey that constraint, which causes it not to be as accurate. So that's a hypothesis. Um, whether that's true needs to be tested. Just as an amusing aside, we also, of course, tried the following learn correction. We took it to be the divergence of a tensor viscosity times the gradient of velocity, because that's, of course, what you're supposed to do. We should just train turbulence models, right? And that we actually found, at least in our hands, to be worse um, because it was more it was more difficult with numerical stability constraints. It had more numerical stability problems than this. So, um, but I don't know. That would be my hypothesis that that this is that this is a fake. That this that really this these two perform similarly. Although it, we don't know for sure. I mean, I guess the other thing to say though, maybe I should just add one more comment. It's possible that it goes the other way. I suppose, and the the way that that argument would look is that. You know, when we do an interpolation, we're doing it over some large number of mesh points. And of course, if you look at the um, effective equation and what, do, what do we call it numerical analysis, the equation when you Taylor expand what you have and look at the equation that you're actually solving, the learned interpolation has more effectively higher order terms in it than the learned correction does. And it could, it's not inconceivable that that doesn't help, but anyway, we have no idea. I mean, they're pretty close though in performance. They're close enough in performance that you would be pretty happy with either, I think. A uh, question from Jack Xing says, hi, Michael, nice talk. If RE numbers go up another order, do machine learning interpolants have to be trained again? Thanks. That's a good question. We don't know. Um, I mean, in principle, I mean, we haven't tried it and we don't know. So I'll give you the in principle answer. So in principle, look, if you're in asymptopia, so you, if you're in the part of the, if Reynolds number is high enough, right, that you're actually in the cascade region, then you, one would hope that one doesn't need to do that in the same way that we use eddy viscosity models that have parametric functions for the viscosity that, you know, depend on Reynolds number in a way that Kolmogorov would have said, you know, and that don't have to be, right, it's the same functional form. So that's what one would hope. The one thing that makes me slightly nervous here is that we don't have a huge range of scales here. The forcing scale, I, I didn't say, but in the Kolmogorov flow, the forcing scale that we used was one quarter of the size of the box. So we basically have from one quarter of the size of the box down to one over the square root of Reynolds number times the size of the box. And that's the that's the scale basically that we're talking about, which is not the best power law scale that any of us have ever seen. And so you could worry that we're not in, in asymptopia yet, and thus it's gonna have to be retrained. But, but this is something, but in any case, this is a, um, is an initial step, so it's a good question. We have another five minutes for questions. Jack says, thank you. Um, so do we have anyone with other questions for Michael? Yeah, I feel like you've uh, you answered all the questions too quick. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. At least I got through it. Well, I just want to thank you all for listening. And again, I want to sort of acknowledge, you know, especially Stefan and Dima and Jamie, um, who made this Navier Stokes thing work, which was a really difficult thing. Wait another few seconds to see if the, anyone has questions. All right, Mike Pritchard, go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, I can't, I can't resist. Um, uh, so, can you can you comment on your your outlook on what the the most gnarly technical issues are for scaling this up to three D? Is it the coordination across GPUs? Is it extending the differentiable programming to be parallel? Or uh, just curious. It's yeah. So it, it's it's purely data pipeline issues. It's just that you know the amount of data you know the scaling is is so it has to be distributed to do 
to do training in 3D. We actually have examples that train on a single TPU in 3D that at least they start to train, but like the memory issues are, these are, we believe these are solvable engineering problems, but they're, um, but it's just, it's not, it, you know, it's not trivial. The, the, um, the code, the, um, the, um, the code works in any number of dimensions. <laughs> it's, not, it's, yeah. it's just a parameter. It's, it's not that, it's just the, the, the memory. So I guess part of me sometimes daydreams in an industry and in Google that, um, you know, they're light years ahead of us in dealing with data sets of gnarly magnitude, but is that like a, a pipe dream or is there something? Well, there might be, but not, but we're having trouble. Is it like the dimensionality of the input vectors become unparalleled in industry for these sorts of problems or? Um, uh, this, or might... So, so th this is a solvable problem, but it's one that we haven't yet solved. Actually, Stefan is here. Stefan, you should answer this. This is your I, I, I... With, uh, Michael on this. I mean, I can say it's just, it's not. Um, I think we can scale up to larger problems. It's just that like the the this is why we started in one D is that like, the, iter the iteration time gets slower and slower. If you have ten times more re resources going, one D problems I can solve. You know, I can solve in like minutes basically. Two D problems take hours. You know, three D problems probably you know probably going to take days at that sort of scaling. Um, or you have to scale up to a bunch of machines. So it's just like the iteration time, the experimentation time gets much slower. So we wanted to kind of work out the details in, in, in 1D, 2D first, basically. Makes sense, thanks. And I think we'll round up the hour with a final question from Drew. Um, he asks, can we play around with the examples like the one on GitHub you pointed out on our own computer, or do we need some very Google-like or HPC computers? No, you can play with the examples on your own computer. The GitHub link that I pointed out was it's a one dimensional example and it runs in a co-op and um, or you can run it on a Jupyter notebook on your computer. So this doesn't you can play with this yourself easily. Thank you. So I think uh, we will end the webinar here. So thank you so much, Michael, for giving us the talk. And also thank you, Stephen, for um, having you know, giving your input during the Q&A when we need it. Um, so I will have a recording of your talk available later this week and I will share a link out to, um, once it's available. The next data science webinar will be in two weeks. So that's on February 22nd and that will feature Kelly Kochansky. So if any of you guys have any questions, um, you know, regarding Michael's talk or the data science working group, uh, please feel free to contact me at jzhu at usclivar.org. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Michael, for your talk. Yeah, thanks for having us, you guys.